Hello, welcome. Just going to wait for a few more people um, and then we will get started. Hello everyone joining. Yep, just going to wait for a few more people and then we will get going. I hope everybody is doing well this evening. Just give it a couple more minutes. Okay, so I'm going to get started and then anyone who joins later will be um, very welcome. So everyone, welcome. And I am Saskia, I'm a voice contributor and we are doing a artist workshop. As you may know already, we've done quite a few of these now with um, Arts Ward England as part of their COVID-19 emergency, um, COVID emergency relief fund for artists where we talk to different creatives about what they've got going on and how they've weathered the storm that is COVID. So as per usual with these interviews, afterwards we'll be doing a Zoom Skillshare workshop with the artists themselves. And today we have a really interesting person. His name is Femi Lewis Adebowale, and he is a photographer, filmmaker and editor. So he is going to be talking us through how he conceptualizes a shoot and then he'll be doing a demonstration on um, Zoom later. And shortly the Zoom link and meeting ID and passcode will be dropped into the chat. So if everybody's ready and hello to that person who just joined, I am going to bring Lewis in. Hello. 
Can I just check? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh, that's good. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing today? I'm very good, thank you. Yes, I'm loving the look right nice. now. <laughs> so how have you been? All good? Yeah, really good, thank you. Oh my God, I'll tell you a quick story quickly. Um, so I go into the office where I work one day a week, usually, and um, I only went in yesterday because I needed to give a hard drive to someone. So here's me like heading out in the morning, it's pouring down with rain. I've got my little travel breakfast in a bag. <laughs> get there, my breakfast is drenched. Like I've got hash brown soup basically. <laughs> oh my God. Basically chose not to come in and she didn't tell me. So I was literally still at reception, like like a drowned rat with no breakfast. And I was just like, are you <laughs> And then I was looking, like, all day today, I was looking at how sunny it was. And I was just like, why could God not have flipped today's weather and yesterday's just for me? I mean, hash brown soup sounds absolutely disgusting. Honestly, I opened the bag and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> flung the whole thing away. Okay, well, bad day aside, hopefully today will be better. <laughs> Um, why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about yourself and your artistic background? Yeah, sure. So I currently work as a development researcher for a production company. I just started working in that role last week. I got promoted. A Congratulations. Uh, thank you. And I think I've, I've just done, I've been a runner beforehand for like two years in different companies and... I guess my interest in the art started, I did media studies in high school. And like from then on, I always did a course, like I did film production at uni. But from that point, I was saying high school was where I kind of started thinking like, I want to make filmy things, mm -hmm. I guess. So that was definitely like the starting point. And, you know, since then, I've just been learning, growing, working new jobs and suddenly here I am. Tell us a bit about um, your trajectory to get to where you are today. You say you've been working odd jobs. Like, what was what did the route look like for you? Yeah, um, so I graduated in 2016 and I was working retail for a bit, like we all have to do, we all have to make that sacrifice. And so I did like a couple of ad hoc jobs here. Like I assisted on a shoot for a music video. I did some editing and these are just things I found through social media mostly or like dedicated websites but I didn't get my first like proper job until 2018 and that was in a post-production house which I got on Facebook and so I was a post-production runner there for about a year and a half mm -hmm. and then someone I met there was coming to a she was going to a different company and I was just kind of like take me with you <laughs> um so like a week after she left I just emailed her my CV and I just said you know please can you forward this on they happened to be hiring and like, I feel like it was like a day later, um, you know, they called me and said, hey, come in for an interview tomorrow. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then I had an interview, then they called me back for another interview the next day. And then I was offered the job like two days later. So within a week I'd started. And then, yeah, while I was there, I was just assisting loads of teams. And then there was one team, the US development team who I assisted for quite a bit. and. They liked my work, they liked me, and after like working with them full time for a couple of months, they offered me a contract, and here I am. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it, how you go like applying for jobs for so many years, graphing, and then within a week, everything can change. I know, it's, it's, it's so funny, because I guess as well, a lot of jobs have such a long application process these days, and I feel mm -hmm. like it's very... It's a very new thing, like it's an internet thing. And I think a lot of these people don't realize, especially when it's like young people is often, like one of the jobs I applied for, they made me edit a video for them. And I was like, these, these things take time. And they didn't even send me a rejection email. I never heard from them. I had the interview on my birthday. I didn't <laughs> get a rejection email or anything. So I think, yeah, coming from that process to kind of just like emailing someone a CV, getting a phone call, doing interviews and then getting it, which is like, wow. It just reiterates the importance of networking and mm. how much I think we rely on it, especially in like today's society. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But um, so since then, you obviously you are a filmmaker, you're an editor, you're a photographer. You have so many different things on your CV, so many things that keep you busy. Which one do you prioritize? Like, how do you juggle? Um, I think at heart, I'm. I say filmmakers are most important because that's definitely where I started. Like when I was younger, I was like, oh my god, I want to be the next Steven Spielberg. I want to be the next Tarantino. And now don't like even them. <laughs> I just think fundamentally, because I'm a storyteller at heart, and when you make films, you kind of have the most, I feel like there's a lot of ways of expressing yourself and expressing the story, because obviously pictures are just, at the end of the day, they're just a picture. It captures a lot within a frame and it's still a really good art medium. But with films, you kind of, you have the soundtrack, you have the script, mm. you know, there's, there's so much more to consider. And especially for me, most if not all of the videography jobs I've had I've had like total creative control so I've been allowed to decide the music I've been allowed to kind of cut how I like and whatever so that means I just feel like I have a lot more freedom to tell the story or sell the product or mm -hmm. you know, whatever else yeah a lot more freedom but certainly a lot more work I mean in mainstream films <laughs> got hundreds of people in pre-production post-production then there's just you like me and my me and my laptop and my camera just doing everything how do you cope <laughs> so funny actually yeah because i mean there was a period like before i started working in tv where i was really i was going through this whole like artist self-doubt which i feel like we all go through mm -hmm. i was really like oh my god this is, i've put out isn't as good as this random person's but then when I used to watch the credits and I kind of saw, you know, 40 people involved in a three minute short film, mm -hmm. um, I kind of used to think I'm one man and I've made some, you know, decent stuff, good stuff. <laughs> but kind of, I just got to a point where I was like, if I'm doing all this stuff on my own, then if I had a team of people like me, imagine what you yeah, mean. imagine like the stuff we could put out. But I think I just, especially when it comes to editing and shooting stuff, I just really enjoy it. So a lot of the time, touch wood, I hope this doesn't change, but it doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. Maybe it feels like work towards the end of a process or if there's a lot of hiccups, I'm like, I, I don't want to do this. I'm like, well, I mean, I put all this time in, I need to finish it. Yeah. Most of the time it's just, it's fun. Like when I edit, sometimes I'll just stick on a lo-fi playlist. I'll have my like circle of snacks around me. <laughs> <laughs> from the world and it's just, it's just really like therapeutic and especially I think I'm a people watcher like I'm one of those people who on the bus if I'm a bit bored I kind of just like watching people I, I hope I don't sound weird but I just enjoy kind of studying people's mannerisms and how they speak and everything so especially when I'm editing or even when I'm shooting kind of just understanding stuff like that is part of the process and it's a lot of fun to me because I'm like oh okay so I don't know they pull this face when they feel this way I need to make sure I get that on camera or I need to make sure mm -hmm. I get that shot so it's just yeah just I think for me the main thing is just enjoy it and try not to look at it as work fun say. story for those people watching people watching is actually how Femi and I met oh no he would just stare at me from across the room in history class in college. You're making it sound bad. We sat, okay, so we, there was, the classroom had a U formation of desks. I sat on one side, Saskia sat on the opposite side. And our, our history lecturer was, you know, um, he didn't reserve his words. He would talk a lot and often... <laughs> retain the same tone throughout what he was saying so <laughs> yes. it was level. full concentration and I used to look around the room and Saskia would feel me staring at her as everyone always does and we'd all <laughs> look away and at one point I just spoke to you outside chemistry and here yeah. we are <laughs> 10 years later yep the rest <laughs> is history <laughs> <laughs> So you said that you're working in TV now. Tell me a little bit about your role in TV. Yeah, um, so it's with the development team and they basically, it's what it says on the tin, they develop ideas. Sometimes like a company like Netflix or something would come and say, hey, we want a show about serial killers. 
And as a researcher, it's my job to find stories about serial killers mm -hmm. and pass them on to the team. Um, they will write treatments and kind of pitch them to the big wigs. And then depending on the feedback, like they'll have a short list, then I need to look into the short list. And sometimes it's like fine contributors. So, I mean, serial killers is an awkward one because it's like so active. But say we had a documentary about animal shelters, then... Mm -hmm. At that point, it would be my job to contact animal shelters and to see who would be interested, talk to them and see if they'd actually be interesting on camera. And like, a lot of the time with stories, it, is, it involves a lot of social media stalking, which I love because I'm a millennial. We grew up with social media. But we all kind of innately are good at social media stalking because when we started, not everyone was on it. And there wasn't so much information, so you had to be mm -hmm. smart. So now I'm getting paid to do what I used to do as a teenager for free, which is like, <laughs> oh, <what's> free? <laughs> That's when you know you've made it. Exactly. <laughs> but no, it sounds so interesting. I mean, technically, you kind of have control over what we end up all consuming in the end. You might, you know, if you don't bring an idea to the table, it might not ever get made. So I know. That's I, filtering that's out all the rubbish. I'm trying to, with certain stuff, always try and find stories where maybe the person is someone I might resonate with, depending on the thing. Even sometimes if it's like, because we're looking into something about like food and whatever. So I'm like, let's talk about food in Nigeria. Let's talk about food in, you know, impoverished communities sort of thing. Because I guess my little secret mission is kind of just like getting more voices on TV that we won't hear of and yeah. also allowing them to speak for themselves in more of a capacity than TV often lets them speak, like showing that they're multifaceted. Yeah. Et cetera. I love that. Such a, you know, <laughs> slip in the good cause everyone yeah, you know, can. You gotta do it. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit, just briefly, because I know you're gonna go over it in the workshop anyway. Mm. How do you conceptualize a shoot? Talk me through it. Yeah, um, I think my mind is always overflowing with ideas on any day. Like I'm a daydreamer, anything. So a lot of the time when a shoot comes up, it's quite easy for me to kind of just pick out on my brain. Oh, I thought about this. So I thought about that. And mm -hmm. especially with, let's talk about the ideal clients who give you good information and are not, you know, and articulate about what they want when they kind of tell you what they want, they might say, I don't know what I want in this product, but I want this product to have this effect on people. Mm -hmm. Then it's, then I can stay, take a step back and say, like, say if they want people to feel inspired, and I can think what story is going to make people feel inspired. So, um, you know, and the, with the good clients, it's a, it's a two-way process where they give me stuff and I give them back stuff and they'll tell me, you know, if they like it, if they don't, what mm -hmm. X or Z. But mostly, um, I think from my experience anyway, I've just found everyone I've worked with to be quite easy to kind of come up with a concept that they've been quite chill and easy going. And they've always yeah. been like, I like this concept and whatever. So I guess when you get that a lot, you're kind of quite confident in your ability because no one's been like, oh my God, that's horrible. What's wrong with you? You know, no one said that yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It will happen, I'm sure, but <laughs> until that day comes. <laughs> so what are your top five tips on how to make a shoot successful? Um, or three tips, if you can't think of five, just put you on the spot. Yeah, God. Um, I think one of the main tips, like I always like to tell myself, is plan for as many calamities as possible. Mm. And even, like, I say calamity, like, not for a comet, hitting the planet and you know, incinerating everyone. But sometimes it might be that you've got three lights you're going to lose, use even, and one of them's going to blow. So bring extra light bulbs. It might be that you've charged all your batteries, but one of them might just, you know, fail. So you need to bring yeah. more. It's, it's that kind of thing. Just plan because my main rule is so many things are going to go wrong. On any given shoot, a lot of stuff is going to go wrong nothing will ever go swimmingly. So you need to make sure as many things as possible are ensured to go well. Yeah. Um, which leads me into point two, which is you need to expect things to fail because mm -hmm. you can't 
I mean, even if you spend loads of time trying to control and predict what's going to go wrong, you can't think of everything. And some stuff you might anticipate and is still out of your hands. So you need to get your brain geared to kind of be ready. So again, like say the light bulb goes and you've changed the light bulb, but the whole light's gone. You need to think, okay, what can I do? Can I just take this light out? Can we shift people around so I can bring some daylight in? Or can we use the other two lights to make better lighting? You just always need to have that brain that's just like, when there's a problem, you need to just say, okay, what are we going to do to fix it? There's no time to be like, oh my God, I'm stressed. Like, you know, some people yeah. I work with, like, I'm always like, be quiet, stress afterwards, let's fix this problem. I want my money. Um, just, <laughs> yeah, because it's vital time, waste stressing is time that you don't have to actually get the shoot done. Yeah, keep um, your eye on the prize. Yeah, and um, one more tip. Hmm. I think just just be really nice and charismatic because um, anyone you work with on a shoot could potentially, especially if you're a freelancer, they could be your next job. They yeah. could be, you know, anything or even you could just make a friend. But I just think you have to always be as nice as possible and you're going to work with some mean people. You have to mm -hmm. smile through gritted teeth. <laughs> and when they're not around, you can slag them off to someone who you know is safe to yeah. or... I usually, like, if someone's stressing me out, I usually just like to go in a corner and just laugh to myself. I look like a nutter, but I laugh through the pain on set because then you just get a giggle. Sometimes people are mean and you just think, like, I don't know, I don't know what's going on in their home life for them to be that bitter, but I'm going to laugh and just shrug it off because you don't want that negativity to affect you because ultimately you're responsible for you. Yeah. So to sum up, be nice. Yeah. Um, take out all the stress in a corner away from the shoot and um, always be prepared with light bulbs and other tech things that you know are going to go wrong yeah. damage control one step ahead to encounter a problem that you you don't have a prepared solution for and think on your feet see that's very good advice you can apply that to anything really <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? It's, it's just life stuff, especially problems, because it's always problems always come around when you just feel like, okay, I can sit down now, and then it's like, bam, <laughs> feel, I don't know, hurricane, or something. <laughs> well, it is twenty twenty. Who knows? Yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed, it doesn't happen. Oh uh, God, I've jinxed us all. <laughs> How have you been doing during COVID? Have you been able to, you know, like? still make art and still be productive how have you got on so i was working home for a month april or like half of march and then april working from home and i was on furlough so i enjoyed working from home um i obviously i was a runner at this point i work in an office of a hundred plus people mm. my job you know one of the main things about my job is i have to be very charismatic very present because ultimately what i was doing was trying to be available so that someone could hire me so if i was rude to someone that's one person who might not want to hire me which might end up being the production that i want to go on to yeah. so um obviously i'm a nice smiley warm person by nature but as any human sometimes i'm not in the mood for it but when work calls you can't show that so it was amazing for me to be able to work from home I was only talking to like five people, basically just whoever I needed to assist. That's when I started assisting development. Um, but mostly I could just be sat in front of my laptop in my pajamas with my face like this. <laughs> it wouldn't matter. But then, yeah, when I was on furlough for two months and I alternate between really enjoying the space and going crazy. But mm -hmm. I decided to try and put that into my art, which is I made a film called Quarren Trio which because usually i shoot with other people i was like i can't shoot with anyone else because i can't see anyone else so i'm gonna shoot with three of me which i wouldn't recommend they were so difficult honestly i was like all of you guys just chill out um <laughs> but no it was, a, it was a really fun film to make it was long as you imagine because it was like six minutes so i had to record 18 minutes worth of dialogue mm -hmm. um and stuff and i had to try and match up like eye lines like pretend i was here or up there um, and all that stuff but it was the first project in quite a while where I just made because I felt a certain way 
Mm-hmm. And that kind of helps because a lot of the stuff I make, like personal stuff, is goofy or it's like VFX or something. It's just for fun. But that one was literally me taking all my unpleasant feelings about the current situation, just pouring it into my art, which I found really cathartic. And I know that everyone who watched it kind of found it quite funny as well. So yeah. that was fun. Yeah. I mean, the two months of furlough just it dragged but then suddenly I was back at work and I was really excited but now I'm kind of like I wouldn't mind for because <laughs> <laughs> I was like oh my God. I'm, I'm at work and I'm like I can't just go and nap whenever I want that's really sad sort of thing <laughs> yeah I don't know <laughs> okay so um where can people find your work oh god um so I've got a website which is just www.lewisadebowale.com um, and that's got a lot of my art and it's kind of just more like a portfolio it's got my black identity project as a highlight which is a photo and video project mm-hmm. um, and then you can also just find me on Vimeo just search for Lewis Femi Adebowale and on Instagram which is here pocket shop which yeah I include a lot more of my stuff a lot more of the professional stuff. I feel like some of my fun stuff's on YouTube, which is Pocket Shop as well. Mm-hmm. So Pocket Shop's more like the stuff I want employees to see and my YouTube is more like all the goofy stuff that maybe I wouldn't show someone hiring me, but I'd show my friends. So it depends like, do you want professional Femi or do you want goofy Femi? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will be um, dropping the places where people can find you in our story after this is over. So just to finish up, what advice would you give to those who are trying to break into the industry? Um, I think the main one I would be is just to keep creating. Like if you want to get into a creative role, just keep sharpening that skill anywhere you know how. Like before I got into TV, I was always making films with my friend and stuff. Mm. I made a fan film for a game like right after I finished university. And that fan film actually when I got interviewed for my last job as a runner, um, they'd watch some of my stuff. And like, <laughs> I'll never forget the HR manager was quoting my film back to me. And I was just like, I mean, sometimes when you just create stuff for fun, you don't realize that it can be, like it can help you in your journey mm-hmm. um, and stuff. And I also say, think outside the box um, with regards to the industry. Um, I would say it like the industry is very, it's still quite nepotistic and it's mainly made up of like white middle class people and not to say they're all bad, obviously, like a lot of them are committed to changing that, but a lot of them like to maintain like people of their own in, which means that if you don't fit that sometimes, like you wouldn't benefit from the practice that gets a lot of people into the industry. But mm-hmm. these days there's a lot of social media um, like groups of stuff like there's social media groups for queer people working in tv groups of people of color working in tv so i'd advise you find these groups and you network and you never know you could just be getting your job there it's true i just feel like you have to put yourself out into the world and not stress it's like dating i think like when you're trying to find the one you can't find the one you just get nonsense but sometimes if you just put yourself out there and you're just trying to have a good time you you can end up meeting the perfect somebody and i think it's the same with work where you have to you have to be present you have to put yourself out there but don't put too much pressure on yourself like enjoy the ride because once you're in tv it's it's crazy um sort of thing when you're in retail or whatever else you just feel a lot more reckless when you're tv you're like oh wait i can't be reckless anymore this is my actual career now <laughs> <laughs> no i completely get what you mean well femi thank you so much for joining us thank you for having me um we are now going to head over to zoom to do your workshop i am going to try and if i go out of um the zoom id will be dropped into the chat momentarily i believe (laughs) (laughs) um just waiting on that i can send you actually the meeting ID. Bear with me a moment. It's up there like right at the top. Is it there already? 
Yeah, quite early on it was posted. Oh, I couldn't actually see it. Okay, <laughs> well, if we just take a few minutes break and then at five past we will be starting the Zoom workshop. So right. thank you everybody for listening and come and join us because I know that Femi has a great presentation and it's going <laughs> to be really interesting and informative, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> cool. okay, I'll see everybody soon and thank you again for me. Thank you. I see you soon. Bye.